Well, again, thank you for being here on this day. It's a windy but beautiful day out there today. Glad you could join us. All of you who are online, that seems to be growing. And those of you who are over in our worship center as well, we appreciate that. As I said, today's message is about change, and I wanted to share with you just a personal story about change that, um, well, it, it's something that kind of, it means a lot to me on a couple levels. In, when I was in elementary school, high school, and, and college, I was in a few things, sports and theater and things like that, and, and so I had some trophies. I didn't like to put them out, you know, it was kind of weird, so... They were really just for me. So I took all the plaques off the trophies. I mean, all the little inscriptions about what I had done or achieved or whatever. And then I threw away all the trophies. And then I got a plaque and I put all those little things on there. And then I titled it, The Good Old Days. And that was when I was in my late 30s. <laughs> and then I lost the plaque. But I still have the memories. Memories. And I think I, I'm old enough now, I guess this is why I get these emails. Many of you won't be able to relate to this because you haven't gotten your AARP card yet. But get these emails that say, you know you're old when, how many of you have gotten those? Come on, be honest now. Yeah, and, uh, and they always have something to do with how, how it was years ago. There was this one I read, I, I was remembering these, I was putting this message together. Uh, somebody asked a question, do you remember when... Cars didn't have seatbelts. How many of you remember that? Never had to wear a seatbelt, and you're still alive. Praise God. How about when hitchhiking was safe and the right thing to do? I mean, I did it every day, every day when I was in high school. Yeah. Oh, and as a little boy, getting a black eye at recess was not cause for punishment and suspension. It was a badge of honor. How many of you remember that? Yeah, those were the good old days. So as I was thinking about this message, I wanted to ask this question for you guys to kind of think about, is if you could change things back to the way they were, what, what would you change? What would you, what would you change back? I asked this question at our staff meeting, and nobody seemed to know, but then I looked around and went, wow, everybody here but Matt and me is under 30 so they're living the good old days. I get that. I get that. <laughs> but somebody did say, Kelly, I think it said, social media. She said, there just seems to be so much information, and it becomes so bitter and kind of hateful and divisive. Would you agree with that? I mean, man, we are in such an info society. I, I, I think that's true. And then somebody said morality. It would be nice to change things back. Where we had a moral code in our society. And somebody else mentioned, of course, prayer in school. That's a big deal. How can we get away from that when we see what is happening today? And then Stephen Headley um, said something very profound. You know, he's, he's preparing to be a pastor here. And he said if he could change anything back, this is what he'd change, that Chick-fil-A would still have chick on a stick. I didn't even know they had that. But um, now for me personally, I remember the days, maybe some of you can relate to me, where I was the designated one to cut the grass at home. And my dad would point out where the gas can was, flip me a quarter and say, go fill it up. I'd walk down to the corner gas station and they'd have this gas war going on across the street and them. 27.9 cents a gallon, 25.9, oh, I'd go to the 24.9. So 24.9 cents, fill up the whole gallon of gas. Can any of you remember that? It, did you ever wonder why you didn't get any change? What happened to that point one cent? Anyway, so some of you, I'll bet you can't remember it was 18 cents. Come on, Rick, I mean, uh, anybody out there? <laughs> 18 cents, yeah, and, and, and it goes back, and some of you can remember when we didn't have gas, I'm sure, but... The cost of gas. How about traffic? How about traffic? Uh, just 10 years ago when we were here, we were hearing a lot of people complain about traffic. Now, please understand, <laughs> we were coming from Southern California where, where 405 and I-5, uh, those were parking lots. I mean, it was two, three hours. You're stuck in that. It's, uh, so we come back, we come here, and everybody's complaining about traffic. 
And, and so we, we had to stay uh, at a hotel downtown for like a day or so because our house was just getting done. And we decided to test it. So we went out like at 4.15, 4.30 in the afternoon during rush hour. It was like on a Friday. And we drove out to, to I-35 and, and we're on there. And in about 15 minutes, we were off. And we're just kind of laughing, going, well, that you know, wasn't, wasn't very bad, man. It's nothing like California. I would not say that now. I would not say that now. I tell you, it is, it is, that's a change right there. I also remember when I bought my very first home, and I bet you some of you can beat me in this, though. My very first home I ever bought was $63,280. I remember that number. I'll never forget that. How many of you got one cheaper than that? Wow. How many of you, 20000 Raise your hand if it was 20000 Look at that. We got a few here. All right. All right. Gosh. Well, I, had a, I was a three-bedroom, two-bath walkout on a third of an acre. Wow. Crazy. How many of you remember when there were no cell phones? Yeah. I re- you didn't raise your hand, Chris. <laughs> That's because you were born after cell phones, I know. Um, so I remember... The first cell phone, I had a Verizon, the real estate business, and a good friend of mine was very successful, and I had a 40-foot cell, 40-foot cell boat, um, and we'd go out to Lake Minnetonka, Minnesota area, and uh, he would take his cell phone with him. Yeah, yeah. It was this wide, <laughs> this thick, this big. It was a big honking suitcase. He had a lug out to the boat. That was the battery. Just so he could make calls. But I thought it was the coolest thing. I was thinking, how much was that? Oh, about $2,000. I'm like, $2,000? Anyway, cell phones. Wow. Wouldn't it be interesting if we didn't have cell phones anymore? We'd have to get back to writing letters and sending them instead of texting or emailing. If only we could change some things back to the way they were. The good old days. Well, today we're going to be talking about that. But not with the intention of going back to the good old days, but rather how do we move from them? How do we move on so that we don't get stuck in the past? Because that's what happens. So today we're going to explore why that happens. This is week four in our series we're calling Season of Tears. And you can see that we have these pictures up here week in and week out. Pictures of people who are crying for some reason or another. The point of this series is really not to depress anybody too much. (laughs) It's not to make it seem like crying is wrong because it's not. It's okay to cry. Jesus did. God uses it to cleanse us. The purpose of this series during the season of Lent is for us not only to value the suffering and sacrifice of Jesus during this season, but to do it through our tears and and to recognize that, that there's value in crying. God uses our tears to cleanse us, but there's also real value in spending time with God. That is a great time for the tears to come. Because when the tears come and we're talking to God, God uses those tears kind of to touch us right where we're hurting the most. And then moving us past those, past whatever is causing us the hurt and the pain. And cleansing us from the inside out. Well, <clears throat> that's what God wants us to do is to schedule time with him. And to get real before God, become authentic with him. Because of the things in life that we need to change. Now, in this series, our very first message was titled, The Tears We Need to Cry and Why. We all cry. The second one was the tears that draw me closer to God. And we talked about how it's so important for us to prioritize our time with God. Schedule it. Schedule it. Schedule it. Otherwise, we just give them what's left over and none of us have a lot of leftover time. And the next week was the tears that help others see God through me. And those are tears that that are filled with pain, a heart filled with pain. But still, even in pain, we can trust God. We can hurt like crazy because of something that's happened in this life and maybe even a consequence we're suffering because of something we've done in our lives. But that doesn't make it mutually exclusive from having hope and trust in God. That's important. Well, today, we're looking at another kind of tears. We're calling them the tears that keep me moving on. And again, they are from Psalm 42. Psalm 42. I'm going to read for you just a portion of Psalm 42. 
As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night, while men say to me all day long, Where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession to the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. That's the verse we're focusing on this morning. Now, as I've said before, Psalm 42 is what I would call a psalm of spiritual depression. We have a priest who has fled from Jerusalem out into the desert. He's hiding out for his life, probably during the coup of Absalom, David's son. And he is weeping and and mourning the fact that he can no longer worship God in the temple because he believes that's really the only place where God can be. And yet, that's not what God said. But this guy's stuck in the past, and he's having a very hard time moving on. I want you to ask yourself something. Has there ever been a time where you have just wept because of something that's changed in your life? I think it would be uncommon for any of us to say no, because change is is difficult. We want to go back to the way things were, especially when things change with the death of a loved one, right? Makes it very, very difficult. Well, I want to talk about these kinds of tears for just a moment. The kind of tears that get me to want to stay in the past. Now, here's here's something that I'm going to throw out there. I think a lot of the tears that we cry that make us want to stay in the past is what I call delusional tears. They're delusional tears because we've romanticized the past. You know what I'm talking about? It's like you're thinking, wow, I wish I had a home like the home I grew up in. We got to go see that home. I got to show you that. It was, that was a beautiful home, a huge home. And you go back and you find it's like 1,200 square feet. It's got one bathroom and you had five brothers and sisters and your parents. You're like, Really? I think I was a bit delusional about that. But I think that's how it is sometimes. We get delusional or we romanticize things of how they used to be. Because it's almost like things in the past always seem better than they are today. On a personal note, I was born in Houston, Texas. And we moved a lot of different places. My my father uh, being a teacher, musician. I was pretty much raised from the time I was 11 years old in Minnesota. How many Minnesotans do we have here today? How many? One? Oh, come on. Two, three, four, five. Okay, some other ones had some courage to do that. How many of you are from the north or from snow country anywhere? All right, all right. You're going to get what, I, what I'm sharing here. Because I'll tell you what, I, I miss Minnesota because I loved Minnesota winters. I did. Call me delusional. I loved Minnesota winters, but primarily because I don't have to live through them anymore. Because when I think about them, I romanticize it. When I think about them, I always I just think about the beautiful snow. The white, it just covers everything. Everything gets so clean and, and so beautiful. It covers the trees and the roads and all the dirt and all that kind of stuff. And then you go inside the house and you sit before your fire with a big cup of hot chocolate. And you're with the family and it's so cozy. And then in the morning you get up and three feet of snow fell. You go, yes. It is so great, I can't even get out of the driveway. (laughs) But I have to. And so, when you realize you you have to, you get dressed. You put on two pairs of pants over your long underwear. You put on at least two or three shirts. Pick up your 20-pound coat. A scarf. Gloves. Mittens are better, and earmuffs or a hat. Am I right? Okay, that takes about 30 minutes. <laughs> then you go out and you get your shovel. You know you got to shovel the driveway, so you start shoveling the driveway. All right, then you get to the end of the drive. You're almost done, and then you run into what? The three feet deep of snow that the snow plow left behind, Right? Because they got out there. And what's, what's even worse than that is you complete the driveway, and then they come by. And then you have to shovel again. 
So you get all that done, and then you go to the car, and there's a half-inch thick ice on the windshield. So you pull out your ice, are you with me? You pull out your ice scraper, you're scraping that off. If you don't have an ice scraper, you have a credit card, and you, you, you wear through about three of those. And you, and you scrape the ice off of the car just so you can get in the car, and then as you're driving down the road, you're doing this. Right? So you can see who you're going to run into. Right? And then you suddenly slam into the curb, and you get a flat. So now you've got to go open up the trunk, and uh, you've got to thaw that out just to get that open. You get the jack out. To work it, you've got to take off your gloves, so you do. And you grab that cold steel in your hand, and then you get the tire fixed, and you realize you've got to rip off the skin of your fingers just to get that cold steel out of your hand. And then you get in the car, and what takes 20 minutes to get to work now takes about two hours. I love Minnesota winters. <laughs> I just love them. <laughs> it's a bit delusion, wasn't it? Yeah, don't be so quick to say that, Heidi. It's just like with our psalmist. Only his delusion isn't about weather. His delusion is about worship. It's about worship. And thinking there's only one way and one place to do it, the way he used to. That's his issue. Again, with verse 4 in Psalm 42, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession of the house of God with shouts of joy and thanksgiving among the festive throng. Again, the priest only knew worship in the temple. That's where God was. That's not the only place God said he would be. He said he would be everywhere. He would be there wherever there was for them. He would be the there there. How many of you have heard that phrase on the news? Is there any there there? I have no idea what that means. If any of you know what that means, would you please tell me after the worship service? Because I'd like to know. That has nothing to do with the sermon. It just came up. All right. So the problem that we have here, though, is a spiritual leader wanting God the way he was used to having him. You know, it's too bad the prophet Isaiah didn't come on the scene for him until 300 years later with these words of, of wisdom. For all of us, Isaiah 43, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. Should I say that again? Forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Well, don't you love new things? Yeah, sure, unless it's replacing the old. Because then that means change. Who wants new when things have to change? And so we get stuck and we cry tears, delusional tears. But those aren't the only kinds of tears that we cry when we're stuck in the past. We also are crying tears from fear of change. Now, I, usually when I ask people if they have a fear of change, they always kind of puff themselves up and say, oh, no, I'm a change agent. So let me ask you to be honest with me. How many of you fear change? Be honest now. Just a little bit. Okay, we have about 50 honest people here today. That's good. You know what I think? I, I used to think I was a change agent until some of the changes being made affected me. Yeah. I'm okay with change for you. <laughs> it's when it impacts me that I don't like it because, because change for me and for you and for any one of us, when it affects us personally, it means some kind of loss, right? Some kind of pain. Something that I really don't want to deal with. And as much as I used to think that I sought change and I embraced change and loved change. I fear it too. I remember the call that Leona and I had here uh, 10 years ago. And I remember thinking to myself, man, I really want to come here. But I really want to stay where I was. Oh, but I want that kind of change. Oh, but I really kind of just want it the same. Because that's a whole lot easier to just be the same, change. There's a book I read in my early business career, maybe some of you have. It's simply called Who Moved My Cheese. How many of you have read it or heard of it? You heard of it, Who Moved My Cheese? Written partially by Ken Blanchard, One Minute Manager, and some books like that. Um, it's a very short book, take you an hour, including the discussion in the back. It's really quite an interesting little book, and the story is about four characters in the book. You have... Uh, Sniffy and scurry as mice, and you have hem and haw as tiny little people. And they all live in a maze. 
And in this maze, they got to get up in the morning and put on their sneakers and run through the maze to find food, to find cheese. And so the basis of the book is this. The mice have no problem with this. They, they run. They don't think about it. They just go, 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 run, find the cheese, eat it, right? And if, once the cheese is up, they go on to the next, and they find the next one. Well, not him and all the little people. Much too complicated for them. They go and find the cheese, and they go, this is good cheese. This is great cheese. In fact, I want to live here. The cheese is so good. And so then they build their social life. They move their home there. They live around where the cheese is. They bring friends over. They say, good cheese, huh? They never notice the cheese storage is starting to dwindle down. And one morning they wake up and they go there and there's no cheese. And instead of running off and just taking it for granted and having recognized this was going to happen, that change was going to happen, instead they just scream out, this isn't fair. I don't want change. Can anybody relate to that? That is such a human condition. Who moved my cheese? We get stuck when we're comfortable with things in the past, with things that we don't change. And sometimes we think to ourselves even now, well, if that wouldn't have changed, my life would be so much better than it is now. You know, I've had somebody say before, I wish we didn't have cell phones. I tell you what, I think if, this, if our country did not have cell phones or computers, I, I think we would all go in shock. I do. I absolutely think we would. I, I know when I lose my cell phone, I, I, I pretty much can't function. It's got everything on it. It's got calendar. It's got contact information. It's tough. That would be a shock to go back, wouldn't it? We were just reading a book called One Second After. Had an EMP. EMPs go off over the nation. Lost all electricity. Changed everything. Everything in the lives of the people in that world. Talk about being in shock. You know something we do here at this church that shocks people, that shocks people in our community? We call it follow the star. You know why it shocks people? And it literally shocks people. What shocks people is the crucifixion scene. What shocks people is the Pilate scene. What shocks people is that on a beautiful evening with angels and animals, and Jesus, the Last Supper with his disciples, and the resurrection, we tend to throw in some gritty reality, some graphic reality. And you know what shot the people? They, they kind of think, wait a minute, you're messing with my picture for Christmas. This is Christmas. I shouldn't have to see that. I've heard that every year from many, many people. Of the last 24 years, we've been doing that. These things I remember, the psalmist says, as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, how I used to worship like this. Sometimes we get caught up in the past because we just don't want to change, especially when it comes to worship, when it comes to worship. Jeremiah the prophet, speaking to the Israelites, knowing how disobedient they had been to God, not wanting to be the prophet to them, but he had to. He also wrote the next book, Lamentations, where the nation was pretty much decimated. It's called Lamentations because he was lamenting, crying over it. But he said this in Jeremiah 7. He says, reform your ways and your actions. And I will let you live in this place, says the Lord. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. He's saying, look, you may not be able to worship here in this temple. The enemies are coming. Life is going to change for you. But most importantly, you all need to change. That's what he's saying. Because you're not living your life for God. And he doesn't want you in the temple just one day a week. And then the rest of the week, you live however you want to. He's calling for change. You know, this kind of change in worship is something we've had to work through here at our, at our church. Uh, it was just a couple of years ago we began with some renovations, and that, that caused some shock for people. When we talked about renovating the sanctuary, then the question was, well, is that going to be large enough? Well, let's do the activity center, too, and call it a worship center and, and make it a venue that people are going to choose to worship there, and we're still working at that. Oh, yeah, and then let's do live stream so people can, can be a part of worship from your home or in a hotel when you're traveling. But we better do it with quality if we're going to change people's viewing and worship habits. 
Now, God has blessed us in that transition. There is absolutely no doubt about it, but not everyone's always happy about that. Not everyone's happy about all the changes we've made here. Some of us still want it back to the way it was, like the psalmist is thinking. For some of us, there's only one way to worship, and that's the way I remember. It's how I grew up. That's just the way it is. You know, I was talking to Matt about this because he went to our national convention uh, a few years ago. It was just three years ago now. And the biggest argument amongst pastors, probably a thousand or more pastors who were there, the biggest debate amongst them is, what kind of worship are we going to do? One half is saying, worship however your people want to worship. And the other half is saying, no, there's only one way to worship because that's how we've always done it. <laughs> we've proven here to be pretty resilient when it comes to worship. We've been through all kinds, from one place to two from changing the seating, you know, we had pews and now we have chairs and the bell's been moved from the tower out to the front and lots of different changes of that. We just all experienced a change this morning. You guys proved resiliency. You got here on time. Time is coming. And that door's going to open because there are some who didn't get it. So are there challenges? Yeah, there are challenges. There's always going to be challenges when you open yourself up to change, but that is what God wants us to do because change is generally good. It's good for us. In some cases, it's absolutely necessary. Now, the change that we're talking about today isn't just a physical, geographical change or style or a place of worship. The kind of change we're talking about today, the change that this psalmist himself needs to make, and so do we, is spiritual a spiritual change in our lives. Because when we don't, we get stuck. When we're not open to changing our lives, to submit to the will of God, when we refuse to change how we worship, how much time we spend with the Lord, when we refuse to turn from the sin in our lives, to change our lives, to focus on pleasing God so He can use us in greater ways, it stunts our spiritual growth. It holds us back. You see, change in our hearts and, and in our lives, God requires of us as his children. In Romans 8, 29, we read, those whom he foreknew, he also predestined. He called, he elected to be conformed to the image of his son, changed into the image of his son. Now, I want you to think about that. Every single day of our lives, God is asking us to strive to become more like Jesus. Now, I know on this side of eternity, I don't have a chance of ever being like Jesus. But that doesn't mean that, that I don't strive and you don't strive to live our lives in such a way that it's pleasing to God and people take notice of that. As disciples, that's what he's calling us to do whether you like it or not. And God has two purposes for that. The first is for us. As I read earlier when we did our confession, we read, unless you change, this is Jesus talking, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Talk about humbling ourselves. It's for us to change. But it's also for others. In 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You're already changed. You know Jesus as your Savior, you've been changed. The old has gone, the new has come, and all this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry then of reconciliation. What God is saying here is, look, you believe in Jesus as your Savior, that's a gift from me, and now I'm calling you to do this ministry, to be my ambassadors. To let this world know what I've done for you. I have reconciled you. I have made you holy. I have resolved that relationship between you and God by being your mediator. By being on that cross, dying on that cross to forgive you. That's change. You don't have to do that. I don't have to do that. Jesus goes on to say, not only that, but I rose from that grave to seal the deal and let you know how important that change is and how impactful it is. 
You not only change because of this life, but now you have hope. You have a certain hope for the life to come. No more fear. No more sorrow. No more tears. No more change. Because we will be in the presence of a holy God who never changes. That's what God wants for us. You know, that's God's call on you and me in our lives is to take that hope and share it. Live it and share it with the people he puts in our lives. This is why it's important we don't get stuck in the past. But we always, always, always ask God to help us change, to be prepared to move forward, to grow in our personal, personal relationship with God, with Jesus, and with the people he puts in our lives. So what's holding us back? Well, I think the kind of tears that we need to learn to cry when we're with God is, cry, is tears that just come from a heart that's open. When we say, God, I don't even know what to pray. I don't know what to say. I am just opening myself up to you, God, to hear what you have to say to me. How do I need to change? I know what my wife is saying. I know what my kids are thinking. I know what my boss is thinking, the people at work. I, I, I know there's some things. There's, what do I need to change, God? What do you want for me to change? When we pray to God and have tears that demonstrate our hearts open to change, I'll tell you what God does. He uses his discipline to help us get there. If you're wondering why things are happening in your life, it's because God is saying something to you. Every time I get disciplined, I say, okay, God, what are you trying to teach me? And how do you want to use me? So how can we begin to try to cry those tears? Well, same thing as always. You've got to ask God. You've got to say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And help me to recognize and accept that there are some things in my life that I need to change. Then confess to God your sin. <laughs> when you do that, you'll know what you need to change because what confession is all about is repenting of our sins. You know what repentance means? It means to turn from. It means to change from. To turn from the sin, to turn to faith in Jesus Christ. That's a huge change. You can only do that by asking God, for his help by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then after you've asked and you've gotten real before God by confessing, you got room to receive his grace, his love, his forgiveness. And that, my friends, is the changing agent that then moves us forward to submit our lives and our will to God and his ways. Some spiritual exercises this week to help us all. First of all, it's always the first one. Spend time with God. Schedule it. Read this song. Write down the things about yourself you believe God may want you to change. And then ask God to open your heart to being more loving, more forgiving, more faithful, especially more humble. And then commit to making those changes. And it's always good to make that commitment not only to God, but to somebody else to hold you accountable in your life. Now, after all that, if you still have questions, come back next week because the message next week is the tears that answer the deepest questions. And again, our psalmist will speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Please pray with